And the next person that's going to join us here on stage is Dr. Kim Nguyen. He's the managing director of DTrust. DTrust is the trust center of the German federal print, Bundesdruckerei. And he's responsible for crypto and chip security, those smart little chips in your ID and passport. So please help me welcome to the stage for the topic of trust and identity in cybersecurity, Dr. Kim Nguyen. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Alex, and uh, hello to you. Thanks for keeping up. Uh, you have had a quite uh, heavy afternoon already. So uh, I hope to, to bring you some stuff on our trust and identity, which is probably a new aspect. Um, I'm a trained mathematician, mathematician, but don't worry, I don't speak about mathematics in this talk. So here we go. Um, of course, this Robert Miller is now very, very <laughs> important, uh, probably more important than he would have thought of anyway. Um, but this is a quotation. Um, that I think sets everything about uh, cybersecurity. That's why we're here. So that's something we have to deal with. It's a threat. It's an existing threat. And that's something that we have to take care of. Um, so that's clear. And you've seen all these uh, impressive uh, slides from, from Dirk uh, just before. So there's a lot to do on the infrastructure side. But I want to talk a little bit about what about identity and what about trust in the systems? How do we achieve trust? Um, and of course, um, we, as you've seen, cybersecurity really relates to a lot of aspects. We've seen a lot about security and infrastructure, uh, evaluating the data. Uh, of course, you can see uh, on, on, in this fair that uh, secure applications, secure software is an important thing. But I'd like to, to talk a little bit about what about your identity and what about trust in these services? And why is this actually important? Is it a critical element? Of course it is. And why is it critical? It's critical because the internet was built without security. And that's not a fault. It's by design. Because the internet was designed in CERN, and the people didn't know each other. And they could see the cable. So there was no reason to build an, a security protocol into that. And there was no reason to build an identity layer in that. So that's fine. And you won't just want to exchange data. Um, but now, of course, we are running a global business system on this. And so it's clear that some kind of security, some kind of encryption, some kind of identity management is needed. But we don't have it by design. So in a sense, we still run all that stuff on the technical rules from 1989, which on the one hand shows how stable and robust they are, but it still shows that there is a lack of stuff we need to address. And of course, Nowadays, um, everything is, is global. Everything is uh, really driven by these big platforms. Um, and so the question really is, um, are these infrastructures secure? Yes, we believe so. We've seen the numbers being invested. That's quite immense. That's a lot. The infrastructures are secure. The products are hopefully secure. You still wait for the right security certification for products, maybe. But we still believe that there's a lot of uh, security inside. But what about trust? How do, how do we recognize trust? How can we see that a product is actually trustworthy? How can we see that a service is actually trustworthy? And how we make sure that we actually speak to the right person, that we use the right service? I think these are also topics that we need to address here. And I think, in effect, the internet probably was designed for a cat. So there's always a cat in one of the presentations we have to show. So here's the cat. And the cat stands for the trust topic. Yeah? So we come from security and in cryptography, of course, we talk a lot about technology, and that's great. But I think, in the end, trust is one of the most differentiating topics that we want to address. So the question really is here, have we less lost the global game already when we look at the big players as the big platforms. Um, so where is the trust in that? And I have one key belief that I want to share with you. I think that, of course, business is global. And so I think CBIT is doing the right thing, opening this as a platform for, for such global discussion. But I still believe that trust has a local aspect. I believe that business is global, but trust has to come from a local source as well. 
And this is the reason why we are still here, why Bundesrokrai is still here. Bundesrokrai has been doing trust in sense of ID documents, paper documents for 200 years. But now all our products are also digital products because passports, ID cards, they come equipped with digital security features as well. So it's clear that trust and identity is also in the, in the core of our product portfolio. But the question is really, we have all these products, and of course, maybe in, this, in the past we've been talking too much about product and security. I think that the answer for what we need to address is really in, in the ecosystems. So do we have the right ecosystems for trust? Um, and I try to answer that with some examples from what the global trends are. Uh, and I would like to highlight two things. The one uh, will be a more technical uh, approach, and the other it's a more regulative political approach. And here they are. So I, I want to talk first about decentralized trust building that we see a lot at the moment in, in the global PKI world. Uh, and then I would want to talk about the IDAS regulation that sets uh, a trust environment for the European economic space. So let's start with some technique. And I'm a big fan of Lord of the Rings. So here's the example. Um, so a lot of PKI at the moment believes in you have to believe the one good source. Yeah? And every one of you who have read Lord of the Rings or seen the films, you know, Saruman, he used to be the good guy until the middle of uh, book two when suddenly he turns bad. And that caused Frodo quite a problem. And we have the problem, of course, in, in some of our infrastructures as well. So basically, we have a trust model that is centric. So either believe the one good source and build your whole infrastructure on that, or you don't. And of course, that's critical. So what, what happens if the good turns to evil? And of course, uh, we now know that Saruman talked to Sauron a lot, and that didn't really help him. So, um, so what happened? And this actually happened in the PKI world. Maybe you, you heard about the, the Dutch uh, CA DigiNota. They were actually taken over by the Iranis, by the Irani Secret Service. And this may sound now like a, uh, a, something, a subtle thing. It wasn't subtle at all, because what the Iranis did, they issued themselves a certificate for a Gmail page, and then they had some uh, Irani dissidents log into that uh, Gmail page, so they stole their passwords, and then they read all their emails, and then they arrested a lot of people. So in fact, uh, such an issue uh, of a technical provider caused quite a lot of people quite a lot of problems. So it is a question of how, how can we actually decentralize this. So and of course, uh, the answer is really, you have to change the trust model, go away from a centric model, and move to a decentralized model, a distributed model. And we see this in global PKI world. It's, it's uh, running under the name of certificate transparency. And basically, this means if I issue a certificate for an identity, it's only got to be trusted if I log it into different independent registers, so to speak. Yeah? So I have to put the certificate in different places to make sure that someone from the outside can actually check that I issued a certificate, that I checked an ID. And it's not the question that you believe me. I hope you believe me, of course. I hope you think I am one of the good guys that Dirks mentioned. But how can you make sure? One way is to look into these decentralized systems to make sure that I issued the certificate at exactly this and this time. And actually, this is not a hypothetical thing. So Google has been mandating this already for a good of one and a half years. And Apple in London last week announced that Safari will also enforce certificate transparency for SSL certificates uh, starting end of year. So this is already a global phenomenon. So we already have decentralized trust models in the global world. And of course, now, being a mathematician, I have to have one slide uh, with some mathematics. Um, so mathematically speaking, this is actually based on what is called hash trees. It's actually the same stuff that's inside the blockchain, more or less. Uh, but actually, hash trees have been there uh, since the mid of the 50s. So mathematically speaking, blockchain is nothing new. But they had better marketing than hash trees, certainly. So basically, mathematically speaking, this means this is some mechanism in which you can store data and you can secure the authenticity and the integrity of the data because of the mathematics insight. And you don't have to trust me 
because you can see all my certificates in the directory services. You can simply look into the hash tree, and if the hash tree is actually verified correctly, then you know for sure that we did put that certificate in. And of course, yeah, so you can therefore distribute the trust from the one centralized source to decentralized ones, and so basically you have the choice do you want to check in all the decentralized registers? Do you want to check three out of five or whatever? And of course, th the same is actually also coming up uh, in the topic uh, of end-to-end uh, -end encryption, another certificate-based thing. Um, and again, we have a centric view here. So I can issue you a certificate, no problem. You, you can encrypt whatever mail you want with that. But how do you get the certificate of the, the guy you want to send a mail to? That's the problem. So either you know him, or you do a, some type of manual certificate exchange, which is not really nice for uh, some type of uh, digitized process, or you have to have a way to obtain spontaneously a certificate that you trust. And again, it's more or less the same thing. What is the right trust model for that? Again, there is the one good source thing, but there is no one single source for all email encryption certificates. Um, so again, the question is, can we make use of one of these decentralized models? And again, um, this is exactly the, the topic where these decentralized models uh, can, can, can work now. And in fact, we, we, again, we have something, again, called transparency. In this case, it's not called key, certificate transparency. It's called key transparency. And again, the idea is um, you put the key that you need for encryption inside some of these uh, registers, some of these blockchain systems, uh, and basically there, your email address, your communication parameters are linked with the cryptographic material. And then you can look up uh, the email address of the recipient. Again, you can check whether there is some key material available. And you can, again, check over various uh, different registers to make sure that this is actually going to happen. And actually, then there are some more mathematics in there. So basically, there are some techniques available to make this more or less privacy respecting. So of course, you can simply write a directory where you see all the email addresses and all uh, the related certificates. But of course, this would be like the spammer's delight, because you can scam through this. So you use, you, so you use some, some advanced crypto to basically make sure you can only ask for an address if you know the address. Yeah? So this is uh, what's in there. So actually, you, you cannot simply search through the whole directory. You actually have to know the recipient's address, and then you can ask for the certificate. And then, of course, so the idea is basically, and this is something that comes, again, directly from Google. So um, I would expect to see something like this in Gmail within the next uh, 12 months or so. So Google is actively working on this technology already uh, in, with the idea that, if, for example, if you use Gmail, then you, you, you will send out a mail, and a Gmail will automatically use key transparency to actually retrieve the certificate of the recipient. Speaking about blockchain, there is another as aspect that I'd like to draw your attention to. If you look at the classical blockchain technology, then of course, uh, there are a few things that are probably worth considering. So the one thing is, of course, the whole scalability question. Yeah? Of course, we are just at the beginning of the journey of blockchain. Uh, and we are still talking about problems with the data amounts. So what's going to happen if you really put blockchain into to work? Um, and then, of course, there is the question of, of validation. So of course, the mathematics of the blockchain imply really that you have to go straight through blockchain from, from the beginning to the end to make it all happen. Um, and so the question really is, uh, it's a good technology. That's true. But are there alternatives? Are there other concepts that we can look at? And in fact, my colleagues from, from, from Innovations and Bundesdruck Rai have looked at other concepts. And basically, what they did is they found concepts that, that, that make it possible to, 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 to separate elements of this blockchain and to build correlations between several distinct packages. So basically, uh, in, in the classical blockchain, you have a hash function as a correlation function, which binds one preceding block to the next. But of course, you can use other functions. Um, and the functions that, that, that are in place here are, in fact, uh, a little related to um, quantum mechanics. So basically, you describe a data package as a vector in a certain vector space, and then you build a scalar product. OK, enough of mathematics. But basically, it means you can take two blocks. You can, you can 
derive a fingerprint and you can bind these blocks together. But it's in a more flexible way than in the classical blockchain approach, because in the classical blockchain, as I said, it's a one-dimensional thing. You have to go sequentially through one block, one, two, three, four, and so on. Um, and here you can actually uh, find uh, larger correlations between larger arrangements of blocks. And basically, this means you can actually apply this now to different topics. Of course, you can use this technology now to, for example, bind identities together, uh, to bind access rights together, and to form something that is uh, a little more flexible than the classical blockchain technology. But it still has this advantage that uh, it controls the authenticity and the integrity of the data, in this case, of the various identities and access rights, for example, encoded uh, in a way that different people from the outside can verify the integrity without actually trusting the issuer itself. And then, of course, this can actually form some type of identity management, uh, which is interesting. Um, and we are just pursuing, actually, some prototyping uh, experiments on that. Uh, and it's quite interesting. So basically, I think, uh, I think it's going to be an interesting way forward with these various blockchain technologies. And I think we are still at the beginning of what we see as applications for blockchains. So I think this is an interesting perspective. OK, so first observation is um, trust at the moment is a centralized topic. It's not going to stay like this. I do believe that we will see global structures where trust will move to decentralized models. And I think blockchain techniques are a perfect means for that. But I think with all the blockchain stuff you see at the moment, you have to take it with a pinch of salt because uh, there's a lot more to come in questions of other uh, related infrastructure elements. And with that, I want to move from the technology part more to the regulation part. Uh, and again, uh, I come back to this uh, business is global, trust is local. Uh, and in, in a sense, you could also say this is, this is a great summary for what the European Commission did on, on the topic of trust in the last years. So basically, there is a regulation, and regulation actually means it's uh, something that immediately becomes a law, a binding law in all EU member states. That was issued some four years ago by Brussels, and it's called IDAS. It's an abbreviation. It stands for the S is for signature, the A is for authentication, the EID is for electronic identities. And the idea really behind that is uh, you want to build a complete framework to make these elements working together in a common European trust region, a trust space, a trust system. And basically, if you look at this, you see some of the stuff that you, see, that, you've, that you know from our technology before, that you've seen at CBIT a lot, signatures and other stuff. Um, but actually, more important is it's, it's, a whole, it's a whole ecosystem of services. It's not only the signature alone. It's a whole ecosystem of services uh, that's going to put under this regulation. And there is a technical framework underneath that, which is uh, done by Etsy. Uh, so there's a huge standardization work going on for quite some years that sets a framework both for building these trust services and also for actually uh, certifying these trust services. And the idea really behind this, build a tool set. Don't solve a specific problem with a specific technology. Try to find a tool set where you have different services, different trust services that you can apply to put trust into digitized business and government services. And of course, um, maybe highlighting one small topic that I found especially interesting from my point of view. When you speak about identity, we, we almost always automatically refer to personal identities, yeah? Personal identities. Um, but in fact, when you look at business processes, the organizational ident identities may be even more important. Yeah? When I get a letter from, from the city Berlin where I live in that I have to pay 25 euros because I put my car somewhere where I, sh where I shouldn't have been, uh, it's not even signed and I still pay for it. And I have customers that experience the same thing. So they, are, they have a mother uh, company, and the mother company sends out bills, and the daughter company pays the bills. And in some cases, they received some great PDF documents, and they paid. And only later, they recognized that uh, the payment was going to a Ukrainian domain. 
um, because the PDF looked exactly like the bill the mother company always sends at the, at the end of the quarter. And this means, of course, that in this transaction, the organizational identity that this PDF is in fact issued by the daughter company, not by someone who simply is very able in working with Adobe Pro. Uh, it's actually a business relevant decision because the money, of course, was gone. So basically, this means um, organizational identity is almost as important as personal. And I've given you a quote here uh, from the Tallinn Declaration that was uh, issued uh, mid of last year, in which the Commission uh, is setting out uh, the guidelines for setting up a secure uh, and trustworthy uh, design for business processes. And actually, you see qualified website certificates and qualified seals, exactly this coming from the IDAS toolbox, mentioned in such a top-level EU Commission document. So that really shows the commitment of the Commission to make these trust services work in, in this cross-border context. And if you look now at the initiatives that the Commission is actually setting up for the digital single market, of course you will see uh, quite different application areas, e-justice, demand uh, requirements, things. So the EESSI is for exchange of social security data, e-health, other things. But of course, if, if, the, if you look at the specific things, everything is very specific, application specific. But if you look at the horizontal elements, you, you realize that, of course, there are a lot of things that are common. And of course, uh, you see that signature, uh, exchange of data, authentication of communication partners, that's a crossover topic. It's, a horizontal topic that is uh, not unique and application specific, it's a general topic. So basically, it's interesting to see that the Commission has very clearly taken this on uh, and is actually puffing, pushing the, the INAS toolset forward now in the various uh, application scenarios that the Commission is setting into force. So basically, this means that the EU market ready is, is really re making itself ready for this IDAS market. And I think it's actually not only a technological good thing, it's a great political move because IDAS is an open system, but you have to come to the EU and certify yourself in the EU to make it happen. And of course, uh, especially in these days, uh, it's not so easy to speak about free trade anymore. Um, this, is a, this is an open system. You come to the EU, you certify in the EU, and then you are in the game, but you have to make this happen. And I think this is actually an interesting political move because it, for the first time, generates uh, a trust space inside Europe that regulates trust services um, that will make trust visible in various digitized contexts. Okay, and with that, um, I'd like to sum up. So what I tried to convey, and I hope I could do that to a certain amount, uh, is that I think trust and identity is a critical point in cybersecurity. It's not the only topic you need to cover. I think everything we've heard today is, uh, of course, uh, as much as important. So we have to have the right infrastructure in place. We have to have control about applications. But in the end, if we don't control the topic of identity and if we don't control the topic of trust, then the whole other trusted infrastructure will not help. So I do believe that trust and identity does play a vital role. In the end, I think, and that's what we see from the big global players, I don't think the products will win the game in the end. I think the ecosystems will win the game in the end. And I think um, this is something vital that we have to uh, adhere to. So I think when you look at uh, what we see here at CBIT, I see a lot of discussions about this type of systems already, which is good, because we came from a quite product-centric history, and I think it's good to move this forward now. When it comes to trust, I think, I do think that blockchain or, or related technologies will play a vital role in that, although I have to say that I think that blockchain at the moment, it's a little hyped maybe. So it's a good technology, but I think we have to find the right operation models about that as well. So of course, the blockchain will simply store the data you put in, but who actually qualifies the data that goes into that? And who is taking care of, let's say, you put a business process uh, on the foundation of blockchain. So who is taking care of the economical risks? These are questions I think that we need to also address when we see the role of blockchain in this context. And finally, uh, looking at, at IDAS and what the Commission did, um, let's build 
the European trust system together, one that is trusted, that's secure, that's open. I think openness in these days is probably uh, more important than it's ever before. But let's try to build this together to put identity and trust in cybersecurity together. And with this, I thank you for your attention, and I hope you have a great day. Thank you. Kim, thank you very much. Thanks, Thanks a lot. So we still have a few minutes. If it's sure. OK, we can ask sure. some questions. Sure. Anybody have a specific question? Yes, sir. Thank you. Hello, I'm an electric engineer. Will it be possible that business models can be built on blockchain without that the makers of the business have the mathematical understanding of blockchain? So they need advisors, as you said, if you put data in it or make business with it, who, yeah. who, who controls it. But uh, will it be something like uh, certain, uh, cryptification with a ship? So which is, if it's if an electrical engineer puts a crypto ship in its in the application to save for the next three years, whatever. Mm -hmm. Maybe you can repeat the question just briefly. Thank you. Yeah, so the question Thanks. is, uh, if I understood correctly, so, so will it be possible to, to build models uh, that use blockchain without actually understanding the whole Slide. mathematics behind it and the whole security behind it? I think you can apply um, you can absolutely. Apply. And uh, if we don't find these models, blockchain will not be a success. Because, I mean, uh, there are not so many mathematicians around who understand actually what blockchain does. And I don't know if you look, uh, if you watch Amazon Prime, uh, there's a fantastic uh, series called uh, Startup. And it has two seasons, and the cryptographers only come up in season two. And I think that's something that, that's typical for blockchain business right now. So I totally agree, we have to find these models. And I think we need some type of certification and regulation to make sure that the people who operate this, they follow some rules and they follow the, the good practices. Um, and yes, at the moment, I think we don't have that. Anybody else have a question? Thank you. Hi. Um, hey. So you said that trust is local. And so I'm wondering how you can establish a technical trust that's you know, perhaps not based on blockchain when there's a lack of trust in the government, mm -hmm. and specifically EU-wide. If I'm from Germany, do yeah. I trust also France with yes. my health data? Well, that's a, that's a, that the question whether Germans trust Fra France is probably uh, has a multi-dimensional problem. When it comes to soccer, no, they won't trust them. Um, I think in business-wise, they will trust them, and maybe that's something that I didn't mention. So for IDAS, there is a technical setup which is called uh, the EU Trusted List and it's a machine-readable collection, more or less, of all the trust points uh, that are certified in Europe. So, so if, for example, if you open up the Adobe Reader, he automatically integrates the European trust list. So in the, in the Adobe system, you can, you can use uh, a signature from France, from Germany, from Spain, and they will all show up as trustworthy. So you need something, but you need some, some type of bridging function. Uh, but the commission is actually providing that. So it's part of this trust model to make sure that there's some place where all the trust information is actually put together in a, re a reliable way, yes. But still, we won't trust them in soccer. Thank you. Do we have more questions? Yes, sir. From my understanding, it would be possible that many organizations have their own blockchains. Mm -hmm. So Disney did one open source. So we, we must not depend on uh, on Bitcoin, so, no. that, so that somebody who is first makes a deal and the rest has to pay. Yeah, no, I mean, that's true. That's what I said. I think we are still in the beginning of the evolution, what we see in blockchain, and, and we have these early things, and, um, but there's a lot more to come. And of course, uh, I mean, we have this public blockchain things. I think we will see a lot of adoption of more or less private blockchains uh, or semi-private blockchains. Um, because, uh, yeah, I mean, Bitcoin is only one variation of setting up a cryptocurrency based on blockchain. So blockchain is not the same as Bitcoin and crypto money is not the same as crypto. Um, so there's a lot more to come. And, and, and I think also there's a lot more research to do, in fact, because a lot of this stuff, as I said, uh, the cryptographers only come in season two. Uh, and that's one season too late. You have to have the cryptographers in, in season one. Do we have more questions? OK. Thanks. Kim, thank you so much. Thanks. Thanks a lot for joining us. Thank you. Thanks.